revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Hello and welcome to our Sunday evening video Bible study for May the 23rd, 2021. We're grateful you've joined us as we study the Bible together this evening. Now get your own Bible ready so you can join in our study in just a moment. I'm Mark Howell and I serve as the preacher for the Midway Church of Christ and I'll again be leading our study. As you know, we've been studying about what it means to be a new Christian. Now through these lessons, we're seeking to strengthen both new Christians as well as some who are more mature in their Christian faith because what we're doing is studying some of the very basic truths of God's Word. Now last week we observed that one who becomes a new Christian is to add knowledge to his or her faith and virtue. To become a Christian one must possess a certain amount of Bible knowledge. We all understand that and we talked about that some last week. But it's not enough to continue with that knowledge alone. We can't just continue with the knowledge that we're born into the family of God with. It would be like a little baby born into the world and, and never maturing, not only physically, but mentally. We would know that there was something wrong. Not only that, but we also observe that ignorance is one of the greatest enemies of Christianity. And we have to battle that. When we think about knowledge, it uh, brings to mind the Christian faith or the fight that we are to fight as a Christian. Uh, and we know that we don't wield our weapons as Christians to destroy people. Uh, there are some religions in our world who believe and teach that that is the way to make converts. You threaten and so that if a person does not become a convert, then eventually you will kill that person. But according to the Word of God, our goal is to destroy arguments and opinions that are against the very knowledge of God. And so we had a good discussion in regard to the knowledge that we are to add as Christians. But in our study this evening, let's once again ask the question that we've asked so many times before. When a person obeys the gospel and becomes a Christian, just what is he or she to do? Again, in answering that question, let's simply observe that when one becomes a Christian, he or she is to add self-control to his or her virtue or faith, virtue, and knowledge. Now let's go to the Old Testament. We may think that we're beginning in a strange place, but I think it'll serve to illustrate what we're seeking to, to teach tonight. In the Old Testament, we all know of Abram, or Abraham, as he would come to be called. We know about his wife, Sarai, or Sarah, as she would come to be called. But we know that God told Abram that he would make a great nation from him, from, from his descendants. There would be a great nation that would come. In the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we read these words. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now the only problem was that Abram was old, and his wife was old. They were on up in years, and they did not have a child, and therefore Abram did not have an heir. And so Abram came up with a solution. He decided what he was going to do was make Eliezer his servant, his heir. And so in the book of Genesis chapter 15, verses 2 and 3, the Bible says, But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. God had made Abram a promise. He said, I'm going to make a great nation. I'm going to bless you. You're going to have many descendants. And yet, Abram didn't, ha didn't even have a child. 
And, and so he comes up with a solution. He said, uh, uh, I'll have to make uh, uh, the one who inherits everything that I have, and uh, I'll have to make him my, my servant, that person, so that uh, you'll have someone through which you can continue to bless me. But look at Genesis 15, verse 4. The Bible says, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. Now, Abram had a plan. He came up with a plan. He wanted to help God out. He, he decided that, uh, uh, that he was going to figure things out on his own. But his plan was not acceptable to God. Now, since Abram's plan wasn't acceptable to God, Sarah, Abram's wife, decided she'd give it a shot and she'd come up with her own solution. And so we read in the book of Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, these words, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go in to my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went in to Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Sarai came up with a, with a solution. If God is going to bless Abram, and it's not going to be through his servant, if it's going to be through his own child, then there has to be some way that he's going to bear a child. And so she comes up with a plan to, to give Abram another wife through her servant, Hagar, that Abram would be able to bear a son. But in the book of Genesis chapter 17, verses 18 and 19, the Bible said, And Abram said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, but Sarah your wife shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. Just what's the problem here? What is it that we're looking at? We know God's made a promise. We know that Abram and Sarai have both come up with solutions. But as we look at this situation, what we need to understand is neither Abraham nor Sarai are exercising what we're calling tonight self-control. We need to understand that. They came up with their own plan. They came up with a way of of doing God's uh, bidding, or at least they thought they were. Uh, they were trying to get ahead of God. And because Abraham and Sarah didn't exercise self-control, not only was God uh, uh, not willing to allow their plans to work, but they created havoc. A and that havoc is still going on in our world. The result of their inability to wait on God, to control themselves and contain themselves, created a sibling rivalry that escalated to hatred and war, and we're still seeing that today in the Middle East. And so what we need to understand is self-control is important. Self-control is something that we as Christians must add to our lives. Over the past few weeks, we've been looking at what Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's look again at verses 5 and 6. There Peter says, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement, that is, lavishly supply, to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control. That's what we're seeking to establish tonight. As a new Christian, we are to have faith, we are to have virtue, we are to have knowledge, but we're to also add self-control to all of those things. Now let's take a look at this word self-control. The word translated self-control here is used three times in the New Testament. 
Of course, it's found here in the book of 2 Peter, where we're reading from. It's also found in the book of Acts chapter 24, verse 25, where the Bible says, And as he reasoned of righteousness and self-control and the judgment to come, Felix was terrified and answered, Go thy way for this time, and when I have a convenient season, I will call thee unto me. Now that's Saul, or Paul, talking to uh, Felix. But notice the three things that he, he talked to him about. Here's this governor, and, and now uh, uh, Paul is, is giving his defense before him, but he's seeking to convert him to be a Christian. And so he reasoned of righteousness and self control and the judgment to come. Not only that, but we read about self-control in the book of Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, where Paul writes about the fruit of the Spirit. He said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, uh, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. When we're thinking about the idea, the concept of self-control that we are to add as Christians, that, that is a part of our, uh, the, the, uh, the fruit of the Spirit. We would define that word as to be strong in a thing or to be masterful. According to Robertson's word pictures, it means holding oneself, holding on to oneself. Or in Vincent's word studies, it's more like holding the passions and desires in our hand. Now, if you look at uh, uh, the dictionary known as the Mounts Dictionary, M-O-U-N-C-E, dealing with the, uh, uh, the Greek words, it simply means continence, to hold on. Sometimes, you know, we hear about people being incontinent. And when we're talking about someone who is incontinent, what we're usually referring to is their inability to hold their bladder, and it results in their soiling themselves with urine, and so we call them incontinent. But as a Christian, we must not be incontinent. Oh, we're not talking about having difficulty with their bladder. What we're talking about is we must be able to hold or to masterful, be masterful of ourselves, taking control of our own life. Now, not in the way, of course, that Abram did and Sarai did. Uh, there's some things we have to learn about self-control. Uh, we can't run ahead of God, as we'll talk about in just a moment. But we have to have control over our actions. What Abram and, uh, uh, and Sarai did was uh, they didn't exercise uh, the self-control that they needed to have. They did not wait on God, and they went ahead with their own plan. Now, as we consider this idea, this concept of self-control, we have to be aware that self-control requires great strength. It's not an easy thing to do. You know, some people have a very hard time saying no to others. There are probably hundreds of reasons for that, but, but there are some that really stand right up at the top. Sometimes people have a hard time saying no because they want to demonstrate a willingness to be helpful, and they genuinely want to help folks. And so whatever they are called upon to do, then they go ahead and do it. They don't even consider saying no. Sometimes they have a difficult time saying no because they think others might not like them if they, if they don't say no. Uh, we'd call these people people pleasers. And, and so rather than thinking of themselves or maybe even what is good and right or maybe even the most important things they need to do, they have a hard time saying no to others because they want to please them. Sometimes people have a hard time saying no just because they're too, uh, too nice to say no. You know, you, you meet the person who, who just has that attitude who has that uh, uh, characteristic of, uh, of being meek and humble and nice, and, and they get overly nice, and as a result of that, they just can't tell people no. And then some people have a hard time saying no because they just want to avoid conflict. They know if they say no, there's going to be a blow-up. Sometimes folks have a hard time saying no because they're just easily manipulated. You know, others, they allow them to control them. 
And, and so there are numbers of reasons for people to, uh, that, that they have a hard time saying no in their life. But some people are good at saying no to others. They, they can do that. Even though there are a lot who have a hard time, there are some who can say no to others and, and really and truly don't have any problem doing that. But you know, out of both groups, usually the hardest person that anyone will say no to is yourself. To say no to yourself. You know, you don't want to hinder your own enjoyment of life. You don't want to hinder your own pleasure. And so you have a hard time saying no to yourself. But self-control is doing what needs to be done. And sometimes that means saying no. Sometimes it means getting up and doing things that we don't want to do. Some of you may remember the name Tom Landry, Coach Tom Landry of the Dallas Cowboys. I remember back in the 70s hearing about uh, Tom Landry, and, and it was at that time that the Cowboys were on top of the NFL. You know, they were playing in the Super Bowl a lot of the time, and so uh, Coach Tom Landry was quite popular. But here's a statement that he made. He said, the role of a coach is to make men do things they don't want to do to achieve the results they want to achieve. Again, let me read that to you. The role of the coach is to make men do things they don't want to do to achieve the results they want to achieve. Sometimes there are things that we as Christians don't want to do in order that we might achieve the uh, results that uh, we want to achieve. And you know who we have to depend on? We have to have an amount of self control so that we can do that. It's not always easy to do that. Sometimes we put off taking action because we fear the results, but even if we're doing that, we have to learn to control ourselves, to move ourselves to do the things that, that need to be done. Sometimes we equate self-control with self-discipline. They're a lot alike, but they're probably not exactly alike. Some have argued that there is a, a difference between the two. They say self-discipline says go and keep uh, on going, and yet self-control is discipline in the face of pressure from an immediate urge or desire or compulsion. And so not only as we think about going, but sometimes stopping ourselves, controlling ourselves. Uh, again, some have said that discipline means adding routines to make you better, and self-control means taking charge of what you already have to make you better. Now, neither of these is easy, and that's our entire point. But in order for us to understand it perhaps a little bit better, Let's take a look at Paul and, and the idea, the concept of self-control as it related to him. I hope you'll turn in your Bible to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and let's look at verses 24 through 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Paul writes, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. Now here, Paul mentions both discipline that we mentioned a moment ago and self-control. He, he mentions both of those concepts. But let's focus for just a moment on the aspects or four aspects, I should say, of self-control that are implied by Paul in what he writes here in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Number one, when we think about self-control, we ought to be thinking about some positive goals that go along with it. Now, let me remind you of what is said in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, 
but there's only one who receives the prize, so run that you may obtain it. What is the goal of the athlete? Whenever you put an athlete on the field, whether it's in football or whether it's in basketball or maybe soccer or, or uh, baseball or in, in the idea that Paul puts forth here, a runner in a race, the person who's the athlete doesn't go out there just for the sake of getting out there. The goal of the athlete is to win. And, and Paul reminds us, and in an athletic contest, that is a worthy goal. If you're not going out to play hard and going out to win, then, then uh, you really and truly need to rethink your priorities and the things that you're doing. But in life, many don't have a goal. In other words, because they don't have a goal, they have no motivation. They have no discipline to get up and to go and to run. But in order for a, an athlete to achieve his positive goal, he has to have discipline. He has to have self-control. Now, sometimes folks have goals, but they're either too vague or just simply unrealistic. Uh, they, they throw something out that they want to do or, or they make it so hard and so uh, uh, difficult that it's never going to be achieved. Now, we want to have uh, 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 plenty of money in life. You know, we start talking about financial goals, but, but, but we throw out a goal like this. Uh, I want to have plenty of money to enjoy life, to contribute to the church, to you know, to, to have, uh, to do the things that I want to do, but then I start throwing out financial goals that are simply so vague and unrealistic that, that I'll never meet them. We want to have good health, but we don't have specific goals regarding our health, so we uh, fail to discipline and, and control ourselves. We want a good marriage. We want it to grow and, and to go from good to great, but we have no goals that will help us to define what a great marriage is. And so we need to look. We need to think. We want to have a successful business, but without specific goals, it will never happen. We want to be faithful as a Christian, but without specific spiritual goals, that won't happen either. And so if I, if I intend to <clears throat> exercise self-control, I've got to know what kind of control... I have to have my goal in mind. I've got to know what I've got to control in my life. Goals sometimes are, are, are simply a pie-in-the-sky dream for some, and, and folks never exercise the self-control to make them uh, any closer to, their, uh, to the reality of meeting that goal. But, but let me ask you this. What are your goals if you've just become a new Christian, what are your goals for your spiritual life? Think about that for a moment. What is it that you want to do? Just because you obeyed the gospel, does that mean that you're finished, that you just sit back and wait on God to come sometime and take you home and reward you? What are your spiritual goals? But not only should we have these goals, these, uh, the, these positive goals, we have to have discipline mixed in with that. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 25 again, and I've already pointed this out. Paul said, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive the perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. You know, once the athlete knows the prize he longs to win, he begins training for it and preparing himself for the day of competition, when he'll go out and he'll strive to the best of his ability or her ability uh, to achieve the goal. And, and uh, we, have, uh, we have to do the same. And if we have no plan to, to help us reach financial goals, um, if we don't know how money works and things of that nature, we're going to probably get sunk with debt and, and, and we will never achieve those things. Uh, we may need a financial trainer to help us in, our, in achieving our goal. Every choice we make of what we spend or what we don't spend our money on determines how quickly we'll reach our financial goals. And so we have to have some discipline that keeps us going. And the same is true when it comes to our spiritual goals. What does a Christian really look like? 
you know, we may have one picture in our mind of what a Christian should look like, but does the picture that's in our mind really fit with the knowledge that we know a Christian should look like that we've attained by studying our Bible? How do Christians talk? How, how do they really talk? Uh, do they go around saying hallelujah all the time, or, or are they more real and genuine than that? How do Christians really talk? You see, that comes from learning the knowledge, but then putting it into practice. Are there things that must be done and things that must not be done in our Christian life? Well, sure there are. And we need to understand that. And how am I going to increase my knowledge that we talked about last week and we've already mentioned a number of times tonight? How am I going to do that? Will I just wait for some knowledge to somehow seep into my brain and soak in into my head so that, that uh, I've got it? Or will I spend time in Bible study and in Bible classes and in listening to sermons and, and doing the things that it takes in order to attain the knowledge? You see, all that we're talking about has to do with our self-control. Will we exercise, will we come to master ourselves so that we're willing and, and we strive to reach these things? But then number three, as we consider what Paul said about this idea of self-control, we have to focus. 1 Corinthians 9, 25 and 26, again, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. The athlete keeps focused on the prize for winning the competition. And Paul kept focused on his heavenly goal of eternal life. The athlete has little trouble saying no to things that, that will not help him or her move closer to his or her goal. And, and, and we, need to, we need to remember that as a Christian, we have to have the same kind of focus in our life. I read a news story a number of years ago about a former Army sniper by the name of Jeffrey Harrison who, who brought a trick regarding how to focus back to his everyday life from his old sniper days. He called it SLLS. Stop, look, listen, and smell. Stop, look, listen, and spell. SLLS. Harrison says it works like this. He said, uh, when distractions threaten your focus, just take an SLLS break. Stop what you're doing. Look around. Listen to your surroundings and smell your environment. Now, what's the point? He says the whole purpose of this is to take a time out and refocus. This allows you to stop reacting to the external stimuli that is around you, being mindful of your environment, where you are at that particular moment, and focus wherever you are on what really matters. Think about that as you live your life every single day. We have to have that focus. What's the one thing you want more than anything else in your life? And I hope that it's to go to heaven. But then number four, Paul talks about what we would simply call wholeness. If we're going to have this self-control, we've got to have some wholeness. What do you mean? In 1 Corinthians 9, 27, But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Now, Paul says he controls his body, but self-control begins in the mind. He has determined. He knows where he needed to start. And so for the very reason that he had written just a moment ago, he said, I control my body, but control comes from the mind. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he had written, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Now, Paul, how do we do that? By the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. We present our bodies, but it begins in our mind. We determine in our minds to, 
to behave a certain way. We determine in our minds that something is true or false based on the evidence that we find in the truth. And our mindset determines our actions and our feelings in every situation in our life. There will be days when an athlete, his body is tired and sore, and he doesn't want to continue training, but he does. There will be days when an athlete doesn't feel like training, but he does it anyway. There are days when uh, he begins to doubt the ability to, to outperform other competitors, but he keeps on training. There may be days and will be days when, as a Christian, you've been beat down and roughed up because you've been trying to do what is right. There may be days when you just don't feel like doing the right thing. No matter, no matter what it is, you just don't feel like doing the right thing. There may be days when you wonder if you will be able to keep up the Christian life. That's when self-control is more important than ever. You see, self-control is not just about avoiding bad things, but disciplining yourself to do the good and the right things that you have learned to do as a Christian. Just as in the case of Abram and Sarai that we began this lesson with, it, it may simply be containing yourself to wait on God and learn from His Word the good and the right thing that you need to do. The only way that you can live a life of self-control is to totally surrender yourself to the Lord. Jeremiah said and many, many years ago, I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not in himself, that it's not in man who walks to direct his steps. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23. We need a teacher. We need a trainer. We need a guide. And that is God and His Word. And once we have that knowledge that we spoke about last week, we have to learn to contain ourselves within the boundaries of that knowledge by exercising self-control, sometimes to prevent us from doing things and sometimes to cause ourselves to do the things that we need to do. One who becomes a new Christian is to add self-control to his or her faith virtue, and knowledge. Would you like to study more of God's Word in a private setting? Maybe you have questions. Maybe there are things you don't understand. If that's the case, let us know. Get in touch with us. We want to be there to help you and assist you in any way that we can. You can get in touch with us by emailing us at BibleStudy at MidwayCofC.com. That's Bible study at Midway, C O F C, as in Church of Christ, C O F C dot com. You can also send us a private message on our Facebook page, Midway Church Jasper. That's Midway Church Jasper, all one word. We hope you'll accept our personal invitation to be a part of our Sunday morning services. We meet from 10 to 10 50 in the auditorium for a period of worship. From 11 to 11.30, we dismiss into Bible classes for a period of Bible study. And we would love for you to come and be a part of our worship service and then stay for our Bible classes that follow. Our building is located at 17010 Highway 69 between Jasper and Oakman. And we would love to see you. Matter of fact, we hope to see you this coming Sunday morning. Now, if for some reason you still can attend in per person, uh, please be sure to join us on YouTube on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock for our video worship tool. Not the same as worship together. We know that we need to be gathering up together. But if you just can't, uh, we offer this, and it's a one-week delayed stream of the past Sunday's worship. And so you can find uh, the, uh, the video on Facebook, or on YouTube. We also invite you to be a part of our live Wednesday evening Bible study that begins at 6.30 here at our building. And we, we would be genuinely happy to see you every Wednesday at 6.30. Now, just as with our Sunday service, if you can't, if for some reason you simply can't, we're providing a one-week delayed stream of the past Wednesday evening's Bible class and that begins at 6.30 as well. 
You can find these on YouTube or Facebook. Let's close with a prayer. Holy and righteous Father in heaven, we're so thankful for all that you do. Father, we're thankful that we can approach your throne. Father, we're thankful for the knowledge you provided us in your word that, that we can know your mind and know your will. But Father, we pray for self-control in our own lives, that, that we will be able to avoid those things that are wrong. But Father, have enough control over ourselves that we'll have the motivation to do those things that are good and that are right. Father, we're mindful of those who are sick. We know of some who will be having surgeries in upcoming days. We pray for them, for the others who will be having tests. And Father, we know that you know the needs of each one. Continue to be with our congregation. Help our elders as they lead us. And Father, help us to be a, a light to those who are around us. Go with us every day so that we can do those things that are good and right. Father, be with our nation. We pray for it. And Father, we know that there are many things that, that need to be changed, and we pray for the courage and the opportunity to help bring those things to the forefront. Continue to be with us throughout the remaining part of our life, and forgive us when we fail you. And Father, one day we look forward to hearing the words, Well done, for this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah, and the glory, revive us again.